Uh, hi everyone. So I'm Hao Wei and I'm from NUS Hackers. I'm also a year two CS undergrad. So today I'll be talking about open source, um, what, why, and how. So let's start off with, um, do you know any of these projects? I'm sure you should know at least one. Um, VS Code is open source, yes, of course. Um, we have Node.js, this is Thunderbird, uh, okay, <laughs> and yes, Nodes, that is Linux. Android open source project, Inkscape, IntelliJ Idea, yes, IG Idea is open source, you can contribute to it, you can, in fact, Android Studio is built on top of IntelliJ Idea, partly because it's open source, I guess. Uh, VLC, Firefox, Chromium, not Chrome, Chromium, yeah, LibreOffice, uh, and the last one, GIMP, <laughs> Notepad, yeah, GIMP, yes, uh, no, <laughs> GIMP, yeah. Okay, there's some more, um, which I didn't include the logo for, Audacity. What else do we have? Um, V8, V8 is the JavaScript engine behind, in use in Chromium and Chrome. Uh, we have LLVM, GCC, uh, Krita. Krita is a video editor. Uh, no, sorry. Krita is a painting tool for Linux, or rather it's for any platform, but it's open source. Um, Java is open source, right? Uh, .NET Core, C Sharp, F Sharp that whole family of things is now open source under the .NET Foundation. Um, Nginx, it's a web server, quite popularly used. Um, NUS mods, open source. Um, there are more, any, any other projects that you use that I didn't mention? Anyone? Yarn. Sorry? Yarn. Ah, Yarn, Yarn is open source. I mean, the whole node, I guess the whole node ecosystem is open source, right? Yarn, NPM, Node.js. Anything else that you want so to mention? Please. Oh, and uh, the previous speaker's projects are all open source as well. Oh. Zilliqa, <laughs> and, and, and I, I don't Windows know what else. Uh, Windows Calculator is now open source, yes. <laughs> what? what? Yes, Windows it's now open, now open source. Windows oh, Calculator oh, is oh, now oh, open source. Three months back, I think. Um, yeah, and <laughs> so we'll talk about why, why all these projects, okay, th these projects started off as open source, but you might, some of the reasons I mentioned maybe later will be why you know a lot of companies are starting to open source. Like why is Microsoft suddenly so invested in open source after decades of attacking open source and saying that oh it's the worst thing ever, and now you know after they change CEO suddenly hey. So what is open source? Free. Mm, <laughs> right. Okay. So open source is. Um, it doesn't just mean it's source available, right? That's uh, a different term. <coughs> when you say something is open source, we are talking about the rights that you are given as a person, right, to use the project, um, and or rather, it's about a cop it's a something about copyright. So the license must let you redistribute the program um, freely. And when I say freely, I don't mean money, right? I, I mean like. Um, you must be able to redistribute it with no restrictions on yourself. And um, when I say redistribute, I, I also mean like uh, without modifying, right? Um, you must be able to redistribute it freely and you must not have any restrictions on your re redistribution. So you must be able to give it to someone else. And that person must be able to also give it to other people uh, without royalty. So this means that if you give the program, a copy of the program to someone else, you don't need to pay the original author some money. That's royalty. And you must be able to create derived works, meaning you modify or create software that links to some library. Without, um, you must be able to create derived works and you must be able to redistribute or distribute those derived works as well freely. And you must be able to do all of this without discrimination as to like um, y on yourself, um, the purpose you are using the software for, the what the software you're linking to and et cetera, et cetera. So, in essence, without discrimination. So it must be regardless of purpose. 
you know, no. so this is the OSI definition. OSI is the Open Source Institute. And you may have heard of something else called free software, right? And there is a whole other foundation for free software. Although you might say that they are just different sides of the same coin. Uh, so free software has also a definition, and it's phrased somewhat differently, right? The focus is somewhat um, elsewhere, as you will see. So the definition says that you must be able to run the programs as you wish for any purpose, um, study and modify how the program works, um, redistribute it freely, and again, it's not about money. And you must be able to distribute derivative works or modified versions freely. So the definitions are sort of similar, right? And, and again, this is the FSF or Free Software Foundation definition. So what's the difference? Open source is about the development process. It's about how the software is developed. And yeah, so that, that's mainly the focus. You must be able to look at the source, modify the source, modify the program. Um, so that's more, that it's, in some ways, it's a less strict definition. In other, in, in other ways, it's also more strict than free software, depending on how you look at it. And the other thing is, but on the other hand, free software, the emphasis is not so much on the program's development or how it's developed, but more so on your freedoms. So you must be able to, your, you must be given the right to study the program. You must be able to modify it. You must be able to um, share it freely. So it's about your freedoms. and. As a, as a consequence of having to have those freedoms, uh, you must also have access to the source uh, in order to, say, modify and study how it works. So again, it's sort of some you know, different sides of the same coin. But there are some differences here. For example, um, do you all know what the firmware blobs are, for example? For example, if you have... Um, so let's say you have a driver for a Wi-Fi card. Let's say your Intel Wi-Fi card in your laptop. Um, there'll be a driver for this Wi-Fi card, right? And that driver runs on your computer's in, in your on your computer's main CPU, so it's running in the kernel. It's part of your operating system. But on the Wi-Fi card itself, there's also going to be another thing, what we call the firmware of the Wi-Fi card. So that's a separate um, piece of code, right? But often, or in the case of, or yeah, quite often, what happens is the, for OSs like Linux, where drivers have to be open source and put into the Linux kernel, what happens is the driver itself is open source, right? Um, and you, you can modify and so on. But the firmware blob, we call it a blob because it's just a hunk of code that you don't really, you're not really able to look into. The firmware blob itself is proprietary. It's provided by the vendor, and they can't, uh, you can't do anything to it. Right? You, you just take that whatever the vendor gives you and you send it to the Wi-Fi card to be loaded. And so, in some ways, or at least in the way I interpret it, it's, it's does the driver itself fulfills the requirements to be open source. Right? The driver is um, developed and open. Right, for in the case of say Linux, etc. But the driver may not be, or rather, people who are focused on free software may have some qualms or issues with using this driver. Because the driver, although it's open source, uh, a lot of the functionality of the Wi-Fi card as a whole depends on what's in this firmware that is sent to the Wi-Fi card. And the firmware itself, it's not open source. You can't modify it, you can't study it easily. And so, that, that sort of, that's an example of maybe the difference between open source and free software. Um, I won't really talk about the philosophy too much in depth. This is, I think, as much as I will go. Um, but you know, there, there are some projects like, um, for example, there's this project called Linux Libre, L-I-B-R-E, right? And they, they, are strongly, they strongly believe in free software. So what they do is they take the Linux kernel and they strip away all the parts that are um, not free, non-free as they call it, meaning uh, they'll strip away all the drivers that um, require uh, closed uh, firmware right, and things like that. And so there are people who, people who believe strongly in um, 
free software, they will use they may use Linux liber. I mean, yeah. So hopefully that, that, that gives a clear understanding of what the difference between these two uh, terms are. It's but for all practical purposes, unless you really believe in um, liber and uh, the, the, the ability to study or what your computer is doing, um, they are the same thing for most practical purposes. Although some people will probably disagree with me, like uh, Rich Richard Stallman probably. Right. Um, so Richard Stallman is the person who founded the FSF, Free Software Foundation. And of course, he's strongly for free software and he's sort of against open source. So um, open source is actually came from, um, so uh, some background on their creation. Open source came from Debian. If you heard of it, it's a Debian, um, it's a Linux distribution. And they have this thing called the Debian Free Software Guidelines for what they, to classify software that they consider as free software. So um, if I remember correctly, the Free Software Foundation came first. And then Debian wrote their DFSG, Debian Free Software Guidelines, without really looking at what the Free Software Foundation did. And because, the, because it's the Debian project, it somehow got more popular than what the Free Software Foundation uh, popularized, or what the Free Software Foundation put out. So the FSF got a bit upset at Debian. And so open source, OSI's definition comes from the DFSG. And so it's sort of like two camps. They are like working at the same thing, but they have di disagreeing views. But anyway, that doesn't matter. You can read more if you're interested in all this philosophy. And um, the other thing is that, uh, of course, which I, I've mentioned already, but free is not about money, right? It's about freedom. So they say free as in speech versus free as in beer. You have free beer and free speech. The first is about free beer is about your getting beer without money. Free speech is about your freedom to, you know. So the free here is about freedom. So you can have companies that, um, you, you can charge money for free software, you can charge money for open source software, you can charge money to work on or do something to open source software, you can, yeah, it, it's not about money, so you can always charge money for it. And there are companies that, are, that, that have the, done very well um, just selling open source software. So if you heard of Red Hat Linux, right? Red Hat Enterprise Linux, it's a enterprise distribution of Linux, so it's meant for corporations that want to use Linux. And their selling point, of course, is that they provide support, right? Um, what, what a lot of open source projects lack is like guaranteed support, uh, where the company, if something goes wrong, the company can say, okay, I go to you and ask you for help. Right? If you're an open source project and you are volunteering, you, you voluntarily contribute, you, you won't have, you, you won't provide any guarantees to whoever's using your software, right? Uh, you won't say, I guarantee that my software will work. But, so Red Hat does that, uh, that's their selling point. So they sell this thing called Red Hat Enterprise Linux. But Linux and a lot of the software around Linux is open source, right? And so you might wonder like, if Linux is open source and Red Hat is selling Linux, then what's stopping me, let's say, someone, let's say I buy Red Hat Enterprise Linux, right? Now, because it's open source, or rather Linux and all the software, or a lot of the software around it is open source, there's nothing stopping me actually from, um, in theory, la, there's nothing stopping me from just buying that Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and then I get the copy of the software, right? Um, the binary and the source code, and now I can redistribute it for free, because that's what the license, that's what open source license let me, lets me do. So how does Red Hat Enterprise Linux, um, how does Red Hat keep a profit? So that's here, here we have to talk about copyright versus trademark. So um, open source and open source licenses and um, you know free software licenses generally talk about the copyright. Uh, you have the license to redistribute things. That's copyright. Um, what Red Hat does is they have their trademarks. So Red Hat is trademarked, and they have those trademarks in the software that they sell. So you cannot um, redistribute their. You cannot sell, give copies of their software because it contains their trademark. It's not so. It, it's still open source. It's just that you can't redistribute it because it contains their trademarks and their branding. And if you so Red Hat actually distributes their source code freely, and um, you can use it to build your own version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and that is what people have done. So if you heard of this distribution called CentOS, C-E-N-T-O-S, uh, that's actually built from Red Hat sources. 
they just throw away all the Red Hat branding and substitute it with the CentOS branding. And so you have Red Hat Enterprise Linux, except it's just because you can't use the trademark, so you just rebrand it. So CentOS is free, you can use it, just that you don't, of course, you don't get any support from Red Hat itself. Right, so why, why should we use open source software? Well, um, number one is, uh, I think, okay, the, the, a lot of you, you, different reasons might appeal to you, different people, but one of the reasons is uh, there's no fear of the vendor going out of business. Like, um, let's say you are a company, you want to buy a CMS platform, CMS content management system platform. Um, you buy it and then one, two years later, the company you buy it from goes out of business. Now, if, yours, if, if it, you don't have the source code, right? So if they go out of business, then you're basically screwed. Um, you have to, I don't know, find a way to extract the data out of uh, whatever storage format that software use. But because you don't have the source code, it will be hard to do so. And um, so it, if it were open source, then if the maintainer or the developer of the software goes out of business or they stop maintaining it, then uh, number one is you can just take it and say, okay, I will maintain it for myself. No issue there. Number two is since it's open source, you can look at the source code, um, study how you know, the data, it stores its data. And then you can say you don't want to maintain this software, but at least you can look at how it stores its data and you can easily um, take the data out and uh, convert it to some other format that you can then use for some other software, right? And that's one benefit. The other thing is, okay, you can see how exactly how it works. So there's some bit higher trust afforded to open source software because you can see exactly how it works. So there's no like, um, you know, you, you don't have to worry about the vendor putting in backdoors or viruses or something into the software that they give you because you can see, look at the source. And if you don't trust the files, the binaries that is given to you, you can just compile it yourself, right? So no worries there. And there's no vendor lock-in. So what I mean by vendor lock-in is, um, uh, you know, like Microsoft Word uh, Office, right? It's a closed source software. And now, um, if you want to open up um, documents created by Microsoft Office, you have to use Office. You could use like other alternatives, right? But then you get, you know, these weird formatting issues here and there, and that some things just don't work properly, and it's very annoying, right? And that's because Office is open, uh, is closed source, proprietary. The format is proprietary. And you know the, all the other people that are able to open Office files, they basically reverse engineer the format, so it won't be perfect. Um, and it, you know, and even with the new format, right, the Office .docx files, Microsoft puts out a specification for them, but it's not very, it's not really done in good faith. Like they put out a specification and then they intentionally deviate from that, their own specification, so that people who are trying to implement that specification, don't, they won't be able to actually open Office files properly. Because Microsoft intentionally deviates from their own specification so that people will buy Microsoft Office instead. And before we had this um, .docx files, we had, you know you had the doc, doc, doc right? Without the X. And uh, that was like 2003 and before. And so those files actually, the format, the, the current format is basically XML, right? And, but of course the details of what's in XML is quite complicated. But in the past, what was saved in the .doc files, .x, .xls files and so on, they are basically just a memory dump of Microsoft Office, like whatever is in the app. So you can imagine how hard it must have been for the people to reverse engineer that. And yeah, so if, if you use open source, if you use open source format and open source software, then you can see exactly, okay, this is how it's reading the format and you can implement your own reader and, and you can be sure that it will work exactly the same. Uh, yeah, you can modify and extend the software as you want. And lastly, in theory, in theory, there'll be more eyes on the code because it's open source, right? So, you know, uh, everyone who uses the code and who has a vested interest in the code working well, they will look at the code, um, make sure it works and make sure there's no le or lesser security vulnerabilities and so on. At least in theory, in, in practice, it's not really proven. And you know, even like large open source software like OpenSSL has had major vulnerabilities like Heartbleed, if you heard of that. So OpenSSL is a library that uh, does 
uh, basically SSL is a protocol that does uh, encrypts or uh, encrypts communications for like the internet and a lot of things. Open SSL is a library to um, use that protocol, right? That implements that protocol, and it's a very widely used pro um, library used by a lot of things. So if you're on Linux, basically most of your programs will probably use Open SSL, and yeah, it's a very popular project, open source, but they still have vulnerabilities that, and some of them, some of the vulnerabilities were left there, were, were present for many years, right? So, yeah, more eyes in the code in theory, but in practice, sometimes it just doesn't happen. You know, because everyone thinks that, oh, other people will be looking at the code, and then uh, in the end, no one actually looks at the code. And um, so if you are a company or you are, you are making your own project, why make it open source? Right, and th th there's a number of benefits here, of course. So, uh, okay, the first one isn't really a benefit, but it's just a philosophical reason. So, source code is, in some ways, it's knowledge, and at least to in hacker culture and, 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 and tech culture generally, at least the olden day tech culture, we believe that knowledge should be free. And so, that should be the reason why all your software should be open source. But of course, nowadays, that's not really the case. Um, you, you get people looking at your code, and yeah, that's a good thing, right? I mean, um, well, can you get you know free, and you get contributions also for free, right? Um, where else are you gonna get that? Or how else are you gonna get that other than you know, making your code open source? And of course, people will trust your software more because simply because it's open source, and they can look at your code, and if your code is good, then you'll say, yeah, this is good, and people will trust it more, and, and they can show, they be sure that you are even if you are like a nobody, you know, you just throw yourself, you, no one knows you, but because they can look at your code, they don't have to trust you in order to trust your software because they know that the source code is there. So if they don't trust it, they can just look at it and be sure that you're not doing anything funny. And um, yeah. Um, and if you're wondering like uh, if I'm just, you know, creating, if I'm just hacking my own, you know, mini project, and why, why should I bother putting it on GitHub, right? Uh, it, all these reasons still apply. Uh, you never know when someone might find your mini um, tool that you wrote for one uh, one day. You know, you never know when someone might find it useful. And th there's no reason not to put it out there, really. Um, you you get to, and you know, if you put it on GitHub or wherever, like um, you know, if you don't put it on GitHub, you might lose it one day. But if you put it on GitHub, it'll be there forever. Someone might find it useful. Um, you know, someone might give you suggestions on how to do this better and things like that. And so there's no reason not to put things on, not to make things open source. And you know, one of the ways to do that is to put it on GitHub with an appropriate license, of course. Yeah, open source and hacker culture. So I mentioned before, but open source partly originated from hacker culture, especially the yeah, especially from in the olden days, so the like 1980s, 1990s period. In, in, back then, a lot of software was open source, in, 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 or rather, you didn't you didn't receive software in the form of binaries. You just got the source code, and you just compile it yourself. So you know there wasn't this thing of like, oh, proprietary software. I sell you this binary. You cannot share it with people. Um, people just shared everything freely. That was like back in the early days of computing. Yeah, and we and both open source and hacker culture emphasizes heavily the freedom of knowledge. So we, we believe that free knowledge should be shared freely and th there's no reason to say, oh, you must pay me money so that I show you how to do this. No, you, you just share, whatever you know, you share freely. Right, so now we move on to the how part. So how do you make your software open source, right? Um, well, the first thing is to choose a license. So there's a link here, which, um, yeah, it goes to this website called choosealicense.com. And this website is maintained by GitHub, so it, I think it's quite um, reputable at least. Or at least I haven't read anything that I think is inaccurate. Yeah, so there's like a, there's a more general guide here, um, simpler guide, but if you want to look at the, um, a larger list of common licenses, then you can go here. Yeah, so this is choosealicense.com. Right, so, you have to choose a license. 
first. And now before I go on further, I must say I'm not a lawyer. So if you need to do any, if, if you're worried about this, please just ask a lawyer who specializes in um, open source li and software licensing. La. Right. And so now the question is, do you actually need to license your software? Right? What if I just throw it on GitHub with no license? Um, so the answer is that if you do that, then um, by right, by under copyright law, uh, no one can do anything with your program. Because although you've put it on GitHub, and people can actually, like, they have the ability to go and click and look at the program and use and download and use it. But under copyright law, you haven't given them the license to do that. So if they do that, actually, they're viol they are viol violating your copyright. So if you, if you really want to do, if you want to open source your projects, uh, you, you should just at least throw in a license saying that, oh, this is MIT or whatever, if you don't care. Uh, because um, especially, you know, if you ever see people, if, if you ever put some project on GitHub and someone opens an issue saying, uh, can you please put a license there, uh, this is why. Because if you don't put a license there, under copyright law, you can't do anything with it. Or, or rather, other people can't use your software for anything. And so if a company wants to use your software, then they, can't, they, they definitely won't be able to do anything because their legal team will like, this software, can, you can't do it because there's no license. So you need a license. And um, so now we'll talk about um, four main categories of open source licenses. Um, th this is sort of my own categorization. So um, most people will just categorize it into just copyleft and permissive, right? And these two are just not there. Um, but I, I, I sort of see it as four categories. So first, we should talk about what is copyleft. So it is quite interesting. So copyleft comes from copyright. And so where does copyright come from, right? Um, copyright is copyright. So it's the right to copy, literally. So if you have the copyright, or if you own the copyright, means you have the right to copy something, right? Make this distribute and share it with others. You have that. You, you own that right. And so the cool thing is copyright law lets you say that, OK, I give you the right to copy this, or I give you the permission to copy this, but you must, you must adhere to these conditions. So if you are the copyright owner, you can say that. And so you can use, or what copyleft is doing is using copyright law to say that, OK, um, I let you share this with others, but in return, you must also, when you share this with others, you must also let people, those other people share with other people. And so we have copyleft um, created from copyright law. It's actually quite cool. Um, you might say this is a hack, right? It is a hack of the copyright law, but it's a great hack. And so that's essentially, this is what copyleft is. It's saying that um, you can, you, you can redistribute something and you can modify and redistribute your modifications. But you must also let other people do the same to whatever you redistribute. And so this ensures that software stays open source and knowledge is forever free. So now copyleft licenses. So these are licenses that basically implement copyleft. So the first one, um, very common license, I'm sure you have heard of it. A lot of licenses, uh, a lot of software on, is under the GPL. So GPL stands for the G GNU GNU, GNU General Public License. So the GPL, um, the GPL has very, it's a very large document actually. Um, there are many hairy details which I won't go into, but essentially the idea is that um, if you put your software under GPL, then anyone who uses your software OK, they can use your software. If they want to um, modify your software, and then their modifications must also be under GPL. If they want to um, link to your software, means like you have a library, and someone else wants to use your library, then that person's software must also be under GPL or a, um, or a compatible license. And there's, then there's this idea of compatibility, which I won't touch about. But it's basically whether these licenses, uh, you can use them together. You can read more if you really want to go into the legal details. Right? Um, there's a lesser GPL, which is basically GPL, but some exceptions so that people who want to use your library uh, don't have to be under GPL. This is mainly for libraries that, like, you know, um, possibly um, so that they, because there are some libraries that are concerned that if they use the GPL, then um, you know, companies uh, won't be, will be afraid of using a library 
because they are scared that you know, then their the company software will have to be um, become GPL, you know, and, and companies are kind of yeah, a lot of companies are actually scared of GPL for this reason. Because like any GPL code any GPL code that comes in is, is like a virus, you know, then everything else starts to have to be under the GPL. And so the, there's the lesser GPL which sort of creates an exception for the case where you link. That means you just have a library and you have a software and your software can use this one, but your software doesn't have to be under the GPL. And this only applies for dynamic linking, uh, if you know what that is. So if you are statically linked, then the, the exception doesn't apply. You still have to be under a GPL or a compatible license. And then there's the Ferro GPL. So this is a extension of the GPL to solve what we call the ASP loophole. So do you all know what ASP is? Um, you know what PHP is? Basically, OK. So ASP is a Microsoft language for creating web applications. Lah. So the idea, the problem with the GPL was that you can have, uh, let's say you have a web application. You have a web application that is, um, or rather web service. So people can connect to your web service uh, over the network. And if your web service is GPL, now if someone can take your web service source code, they can improve it, and then they can run their web service. So now the problem is that um, because people who connect to your web service or your modified web service are not really running the software directly, the GPL doesn't apply because you're not actually redistributing the modified version, right? So it doesn't apply. So to solve this loophole, the AGPL says that you must also provide the source code to people who can use your software over the network. Uh, so that sort of closed the AS, um, ASP loophole. That's what they called it. Um, yeah. So you might use the AGPL if you're developing like a network, a server, or some kind of things like that to ensure that um, you know I can't just take your software and modify it and not share the source code again because I'm not redistributing the software. Right? People can connect to it, but they're not redistributing it. So the GPL doesn't stop that, but you can use the AGPL for that. Okay, then we have uh, partially partially copyleft licenses. So um, th there's only one in this category that that's common. Uh, it's the Mozilla Public License. So I say I, I call this sort of approximately equal to the. It's like the GPL, but it it allows you to link freely. That means if I have uh, MPL MPL library and a company wants to use my library, they can use it, no problem. Even if their software isn't open source, they can also link it statically, which is fine, under the MPL. As long as they keep like the parts of, as long as they keep my library itself open source. So if they modify my library, then they have to also release the source to my library, but the rest of their program isn't affected. So I say that it's like the GPL, except it minuses the virality upon linking. So I can take the MPL license software and link and combine it with other software without all the other software having to be GPL as well. So that's partial copyleft. So basically, it's still copyleft for the source code and the, and the, like the code of the library itself, but it doesn't make everything else have to be GPL or whatever. So it's not as viral. So I think Firefox is under the MPL, I'm not sure, but it's by Mozilla. Um, yeah. It's uh, not very common. Some people will just lump it together with um, copyleft licenses because it's still copyleft. It's just a bit less. Okay, permissive licenses. So permissive licenses are just um, th these are very common nowadays. The BSD two clause, uh, BSD three clause, uh, Apache license, MIT license. I'm sure you heard of these, right? So these licenses basically say um, you can do whatever you want to the software. Just keep my copyright notice and the license notice, right? Um, the BSD three clause adds a non-endorsement clause. So basically, the non-endorsement clause it says that um, if uh, if you use my software, you cannot say that I endorsed your project or whatever because you're using my software, right? Non-endorsement clause. And then Apache um, adds a patent license clause. So um, clause. So th these two licenses were written in a time before it was established that um, software can be patented. So Apache 
came after that, and so they fixed the issues of patents where, um, so basically the Apache license says that if any patents are required in the use of this software, then you are granted a license to use those patents as well to solve that issue. Um, but for practical purposes to us, right, it, it, they are mostly the same. Uh, a lot of software nowadays are written under, released under MIT license, Apache license, BSD two clause license, um, the tree clause is slightly less common, yeah, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so basically these, these licenses are not copyleft. So it's possible for a, a company to just take this, take software that are licensed under these and just take them, modify them, and they don't have to release the modified source code. Um, they just have to keep the copyright notice or license notice or whatever. So if you use Android, for example, um, if you use Android, you might go to your about page, right? Your phone about page, I'm sorry if you can't see this. But if you go to your phone about page, there might be this uh, little, in your settings, there'll be an about page. And then at the, all the way at the bottom, there'll be this thing called legal information. And then you might see some lines saying third party licenses. And that's where they list all the licenses of all the software that they use. So it's a very long document and they list every single copyright notice for all the software. And you can find this in other software as well. But yeah, so that, that's the license at action, right, in action. You can see it, um, and they will say, they will list the license and the copyright notice. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it, there's a lot, because for every, every single software that they use that is licensed under these licenses, they have, to they have to reproduce the copyright notice. So they will reproduce every single thing, and they have to, under, under, in order to comply with the license. Okay, and then there's public, license, uh, public domain licenses. So uh, these are just, these licenses basically say that you can do whatever you want, right? Um, you can just, yeah. So they are unlicensed, there's a CC0, and also there's the WTFPL, right? Um, I'm sure if you heard of it, so the WTFPL is a rather, I don't know, tongue in cheek implementation of this. Um, the phrasing is, um, the, the license file is just, it says zero. You just do you want to. Okay, you can go and look it up. So public domain licenses just tell you, just say you can do whatever you want, right? And you might wonder, say, yeah. You might wonder like, um, is this different from just putting it in the public domain, right? Can you just say, oh, I put my software in the public domain? The difference is that um, in certain jurisdictions, like uh, European Union, there's no such thing as a public domain. So if you say you put your software in the public domain, it will work in like the US, but in the EU, um, that's as good as you haven't done anything. So if you really want to uh, say do whatever you want, then you, can, you should use these licenses instead of, uh, instead of not using a license at all, and instead of saying public domain so that, um, in theory, it should work in more jurisdictions. But again, I'm not a lawyer. Okay, so that's about licenses. And how do you make your software open source? Uh, oh yeah, okay, sorry. So the first step was to choose a license, right? And we covered the different types of licenses. And number two is to distribute your software under that license. So yeah, at the start, you know, if you look at open source projects, you might see something like that at the top of every source file this source code is, or something, something. The GPL or whatever will have a different header. So you just look at the, go to the website for that license and then they'll, they'll tell you some, they'll give you some instructions on how to use it. So they'll tell you, you can, you can put this at the top of your source code. Right? And then you should include a license file along with your source code, which includes the entire license. So you can see this in like uh, GitHub repositories where there's usually a license file somewhere in the repository. And for me, I like to use the markdown versions so that if I click on the file in GitHub, then it's nicely formatted, you know. But, yeah. um, and then you should put somewhere in your program. So you can find this in like uh, a lot of open source programs. So if you go to like, this is Firefox. So if you go to there, they'll tell you that, oh, this, this program is say, um, open source under the MPL, right? And and you can um, you can find this in other programs as well. So if I say GCC version, let me do that again. See, if I call GCC version, right, it will tell me 
there's a open source or license notice here. So this is free software. Um, see the source for copying conditions. But they, they will say something about the license of the software. Oh, OK, you want to take photo? <laughs> sure. All right. So that's essentially that's it, right? You're done. You just all all you need to do to make something open source is that, right? You just need to include the license file. Um, uh, the minimum you need to do is include the license file. It's good to also add the header on top of each source file, but you don't really really have to do that. Although it's still good to do it, right? And then GitHub, if you if you publish your software on GitHub, then you know GitHub has that. Um, I'm not sure if you can see, but on the right side. There's a yeah, it's not. I can't zoom in. If on the right side there will be this uh, little thing saying the license that GitHub has detected, so you are now open source. And some tips for some good practices: um, you should have a contributing file if you are if you publish your software on GitHub, or actually if 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 you publish your open source software at all, you should have some guide for on how to to let people know how they should contribute. Any style guides you want them to follow, um, you know how how they should how they should contribute a patch if if you are not using the GitHub pull request workflow that kind of thing. Um, it's good to like uh, mark out you know uh, good first issues. So if you go to like uh, if you look at like uh, NUS mods right, they will mark out um, they will mark out things as a uh, good first issue, right? So to encourage people to encourage people to do that, you should. It's good to mark out good first issues to to you know uh, let well, well like new people, people new to your project to contribute easily. And, and there's more tips here uh, by GitHub. So this link is a open source dot guide. Yeah, and uh, it's a which website by GitHub that goes into more detail than I do in this talk. Yeah, open source dot guide. It's also by GitHub. Right. Okay. Um, now here's the last part of the talk. It's how to contribute to open source. So uh, I assume uh, you have a project that you want to already contribute to, right? Or whatever it is. But you need to find something you should do first. So you can look at the bug tracker of um, project, right? Um, and just look at the bug tracker, or if you find a bug yourself. If you run into a bug yourself, just or if you have a feature in the project that you want, yeah, that's something you can contribute. Right. Then you need to set up the environment, right? So you need to be able to build the software in order to contribute. So usually large projects will have some sort of guide on how to get started. So I've here I have the Mozilla Firefox guide. Alright, contributing to the Mozilla code base. And they have a very long, um, you know, uh, they tell you to first figure out how to build it, find something to work on, fix the bug, and then, yeah. But the important thing is to be able to figure out how to build the software and, you know, maybe learn what libraries, frameworks they use, and so on. This is more so for larger projects, so if it's just a small program, then uh, this shouldn't be an issue. La. Right. Uh, do do the thing right. The, do your change. Fix the bug. Add the feature, and then figure out how to send the patch in. Right. Not every project uses GitHub pull requests. Um, especially larger projects, they have their own workflow and they have their own framework. Um, they have their own bug tracker, patch tracker, or if you're contributing to the Linux kernel, they use email. So again, look for the documentation. They, if they don't use GitHub, they will definitely have a guide on uh, how to submit a patch exactly. Um, again, this is the Mozilla one. Right, how to submit a patch, and they tell you, yeah, they have a long document on telling you how you should prepare the patch, how their workflow works, things like that. Which again, I won't go into, because this talk isn't about Firefox. Right. Um, yeah, so figure out how you should send the patch, and then send the patch in, of course. And now, I think a lot of people who are new to open source, they are a bit scared. Like, what if people judge my code? What if they scream at me? What if they think my code is not good? I would say, don't be afraid, right? Um, 
yeah, don't be afraid of your code being judged. Um, you know, because ultimately maintainers want the best for their project, and they will be strict about the code that you are sending in, right? And it, it, they mean well, unless they are outright attacking you, right? They mean well, and you must make you you must know that a lot of the people who you know a lot of people in the community are not native English speakers, so the way they respond to your or the way they give you feedback might come off as rude or harsh. Don't take that to heart because they are not they may not be English uh, native English speakers, so they might not know ex they, they might not know that they're being rude, you know. So just take the feedback, fix it, you improve and you help the project. Right, so send the patch. And of course if they raise any issues, don't defend yourself, right? Uh, especially if it's stylistic issues, you know, just just fix it. Um and then you're done, right? Then you get the you know if you if you're in a bug tracker then you'll be assigned to the bug and then after that it'll be fixed. So cool, the bug is fixed by you. And your name will be forever in the commit history of the of the project and that's nice, right? And the other thing is that uh, code code isn't all that you can do, right? Um I think maintainers as appreciate documentation a lot because especially for those smaller projects, they don't have time to write great documentation. And so if you use the software and you, you know that the documentation is lacking, you can contribute that. And they'll appreciate it. I'm sure they, do, they, they will appreciate it because they don't have the time or they just don't care about documentation. But they know people will ask them for it. And if you give it to them, they'll be more than happy to take it in. All right. And so last thing is why? Why should you contribute to open source? Right. Um, so this is a bit of like what my personal take on things. So uh, as a programmer, it's your way of contributing to the community. It's your way of using your skills to benefit the world at large. Because your software, you put it out there, anyone can use it. And if you fix something that affects a lot of people, then you, you have changed or you have improved the lives of many people just by the small bit. But it's still something, right? If you contribute to Firefox or Linux or Chrome or whatever, your contribution will affect many, many users, millions, billions even, depending on what project you contribute to. And the same applies to open sourcing your own projects. And some more practical reasons, you, you get free code review again. This is something very hard to come by. You, you, you get to learn, you get free feedback from people who have you know, worked for years and years on things. Um, you get to know like-minded people, people who are interested in, uh, in the same things you are, on the same projects you are working on. This may not apply for all projects, but uh, you put your name out there, right? Because once you contribute, then your, your name will forever be in the commit history if you use your real name, right? Or even if you use a pseudonym. And of course, you develop your own ability to work in foreign code bases. Because when you contribute, like, let's say you contribute a bug fix, you have, you, have to, you have to dive into the code base and figure out exactly what's wrong. So, you know, it's a win-win for everyone. Yeah, so contribute now, right? If you have run into a bug recently, don't just, you know, don't just work around it, right? Go, go and debug it and fix it. And if you've recently wanted a feature in something, you know, see if you can help to uh, implement it, right? Especially if it's been months and then like, the, you know, you, you, people have been asking for a feature, no one has done it, and you can be the one to do it, and then everyone will be like, oh, yay, I love you. You know, um, yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, you have any questions? Thank you. And uh, appreciate it if you could help us do our feedback form as usual. Um, anyone have any questions? What do you use for so in the past, I used GPL v3 a lot. Then after that, I started to use MIT and BSD2 clause. But I think if I were to create a new project nowadays, it would probably be MPL, because I still want I still I don't want people to take my stuff and you know and, and then improve it and then like it becomes proprietary. But at the same time, I don't want people to I don't want companies to be a bit worried about using my project because it's under the GPL. So 
I think the MPL, MPL is a good balance between copyleft and permissive. But then again, MPL, I'm not, I don't think it's very popular, so it may not be as widely um, tested in courts. So, I, I mean, open source itself hasn't really been tested in courts, actually, as far as I know of. So, yep. Uh, is the QR code okay? You can just key in the, yeah. Uh, any questions? Yep. There was something I wanted to say, but I forgot. Uh, do, do you all want these slides? Yeah. Yes. I was a bit concerned because I have like all these logos at the front, you know, and then like I, I don't know if I run into trademark issues. Okay, but maybe I'll just remove the logos, okay? Give me a moment. Uh. 